Hello, good evening, everybody. Hello, good evening. Let's wait for a few minutes till more people join. So, are there any questions from the morning session? Feel free to ask any question whatsoever. Never hesitate to ask questions because in science, that's what we do. We are supposed to be skeptical of everything. So go and ask questions. All right, if there are no questions from the morning session, then we can proceed. Right, so we were discussing the basic physics of stellar evolution, and I think I stopped at a qualitative discussion regarding why a star sufficiently of low mass, meaning stars of the type of sun, why it undergoes evolution in which it becomes a red giant. And the reason is that for a sun-like star, when the core becomes rich in either carbon, oxygen, or nitrogen, uh, no more fusion reaction can take place because carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, they have higher number of protons in the nucleus and therefore trying in order that such high Z nuclei, they can overcome the nuclear barrier and come close together, one would need higher temperature. And uh, such high temperature cannot be attained for uh, stars whose masses are of the order of uh, sun's mass. And that is the reason why when the core becomes cold enough and shrinks, the shell surrounding the core, which is made out of hydrogen, that also shrinks. And when the density becomes high enough and the temperature becomes high enough, the Hydrogen shell surrounding the core, it starts undergoing thermonuclear fusion, uh, in which again protons of the shell they fuse to become helium. And because the shell is above the core and the envelope surrounding the shell directly uh, gets heated up because of the thermonuclear fusion of the hydrogen shell, the envelope starts expanding as the envelope is further away from the core and therefore the gravitational attraction that it, feel, that it feels due to the interior masses, that gravitational attractive force is not very strong enough. So, the 
the energy released from the hydrogen shell burning, the heat makes the envelope of the star expand. And it expands, become very large, and becomes a red giant star. Now let's go ahead further. So this slide essentially summarizes the sequences of various stages for different types of stellar masses. So for example, the case of a sun-like star, as I mentioned, the, when the shell burning takes place, the outer envelope, it expands and becomes a red giant star. So then you might wonder what happens to the star finally after red giant phase what? Again, after about billion years, when the core cools down, remember the core is now rich in carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. The core, when it becomes cold enough, it starts shrinking and it keeps shrinking till the density of the core is so high that the electrons corresponding to carbon, oxygen and nitrogen nuclei, the density is so high that the electrons are not able to see which nucleus it is bound to. The density being so, so high, the electronic wave function for different nuclei, they overlap. And in such a situation, uh, one calls the state of the electrons to be in a degenerate state because the electrons, they can't distinguish whether they are bound to nucleus 1 or nucleus 2 or nucleus 3 because the density is very large. Such a system of degenerate electrons, they constitute what is called a white dwarf system in which the core already has become very cold. So clearly the thermal pressure is not high enough to resist against gravitational collapse, but because the electrons, they now form a sea of fermions within a gravitational potential well created by the nuclei and because of the gravitational potential well created by the Coulombic forces, these electrons they, due to their thermionic nature and because Pauli exclusion principle says that no two identical fermion can have the same state, the, the degenerate system of electrons, they cannot squeeze into smaller volumes indefinitely. And therefore, the pressure arising mainly due to the fact that the Fermi energy level, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, they go up if you try to squeeze the system of degenerate electrons further. And hence, the repulsive force created because of the increase in the Fermi energy level, that repulsive force it balances the gravitational attraction and such a system where a degenerate system of electrons along with the corresponding uh, nuclei, they 
remain in a hydrostatic equilibrium mainly because of the poly exclusion principle related pressure such a system is called a white dwarf i don't want to go into details here but as a matter of historical fact uh, i must tell you that subramanian chandrashekhar who was only about 19 years of age and on his way to england for his higher studies at cambridge uh, and he was he had sailed uh, in a ship to reach london during the long voyage he realized that for higher mass white dwarf stars the density was so large that the electrons they essentially are moving with relativistic speed and the old calculations of fowler and other astrophysicists which showed that white dwarfs can be stable because of the degenerate pressure arising out of poly exclusion principle that will not hold good when the density is so high that the electrons are whizzing by with relativistic speed and he showed that there is a critical mass whose value is of the order of 1.4 times sun's mass and what he showed was that if the white dwarf mass exceeds this critical mass limit then it has to implode that means it has to collapse it cannot remain as a stable white dwarf and rest is history and eventually around 1983 rather in 1983 uh, s chandrashekhar was awarded nobel prize but one must also remember that chandrashekhar to his credit has uh, several other predictions some of them have already been shown to be uh, correct from astronomical observations later on uh, if i have time i will expand on the other contributions of subramanian chandrashekhar like dynamical friction the so called uh, chandrashekhar subramanian friedman schultz instability in rapidly rotating objects and uh, also the so called uh, uh, instabilities in plasma there are many things which he predicted and several of them have been uh, corroborated right but let's go into the evolution for other uh, systems for low mass stars as you can uh, see in the upper panel for stars that are uh, having mass less than sun's mass let's say 1/10th of the sun's mass the uh, Uh, such a low mass star as it undergoes stellar evolution it finally evolves into a brown dwarf meaning uh, a smaller variety of white dwarf and it will be not so hot as to uh, shine at higher frequencies unlike white dwarfs and that's the reason why they have been christened as brown dwarfs more dramatic consequences are those for uh, high mass stars that is stars whose masses are more than 10 times sun's mass there because the core certainly would have mass more than the chandrashekhar uh, limit that means the core mass will be greater than 1.4 times sun's mass the core would not live as a stable white dwarf but would implode and depending upon the core mass will either go into a neutron star phase or it will go into a black hole phase all right at the moment all these will appear to you merely as information uh, not as uh, some kind of a analytical way of understanding but soon we will also take up simple calculations to understand uh, when 
uh, a star would become a white dwarf or when neutron star and when black holes. At the moment, I'm just giving you a flavor of uh, the entire uh, subject of stars and stellar evolution. You might wonder that uh, how would a white dwarf be different from a star-like sun? So this slide presents this. Incidentally, I must tell you that the first white dwarf that was discovered was the companion of the Sirius star. Remember, when we are talking about the Orion constellation, I drew your attention to a constellation called Sirius or the dog-like, uh, dog-shaped uh, group of stars that was uh, below the right leg of the Orion constellation. And the brightest star in that uh, constellation is called the Sirius or the Dog Star. And this star is known to have a companion which is not uh, visible with naked eyes. But when one peers at the Dog Star or the Sirius Star with a naked eye, one sees the very faint companion. And it turned out that when observation of this faint star was created, uh, it was uh, made, uh, it turned out that only way to explain such a star was to use the theory of white dwarfs. Now, uh, what would be the density of such a white dwarf star? And one can show through calculation that the white dwarf star density typically is million times that of water. That means the density will be 10 to the power 6 grams per centimeter cube. Similarly, the size, obviously, the density is so large, size must be extremely small. So here is a comparative picture of sun. And if the sun were to become a white dwarf, so you can see sun's present radius is 6.96 into 10 raised to power 5 kilometers. While if sun becomes a white dwarf, then its radius will be only 6,000 kilometers. That means when sun becomes white dwarf, becomes a white dwarf, it will essentially be of the same size as Earth. Although mass will be the usual 2 into 10 to the power 33 gram, but the size of white dwarf sun would be uh, essentially similar to Earth's size. Here is a picture of Subramanian Chandrasekhar. Uh, as you can see, he was born uh, in Lahore during the time before uh, independence. And um, he happened to be also the nephew of the Nobel laureate Sir C. V. Raman, who had discovered uh, the so-called uh, scattering in which uh, the emerging light would have a wavelength either smaller or larger, the so-called Stokes and anti-Stokes lines, and because of which uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. And also, uh, 28th February is celebrated as the National Science Day because C. V. Raman had discovered that effect on 28th of February. And as I mentioned, uh, Chandrasekhar uh, did the essential calculation of the critical mass for the white dwarf at the age of 19 when he was on board a ship uh, to reach London. Now, again, uh, 
I, I, I only want to draw a fact that Chandrasekhar's critical mass, that formula is given by this expression. And as you can see, uh, in uh, Chandrasekhar's critical mass formula, only the fundamental constants appear. The edge bar related to Planck's constant speed of light, capital G corresponding to Newtonian uh, gravitational constant, and mass of the um, hydrogen, which is essentially proton mass. There are factors like mu e, which is the mean, mo mean molecular weight, but otherwise the expressions are made out of fundamental constants. All right. And here is a look at a cluster of stars. There are many such clusters of stars uh, orbiting in highly eccentric orbit around the nucleus of our galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. They are called globular clusters. And uh, if one expands this small region into this bigger uh, panel, then the circle dots are the actual observed white dwarfs. The circles are, of course, uh, made to pinpoint the tiny dots. These tiny dots are the white dwarfs that were actually observed in the region of a globular cluster, which has been named as M4, meaning fourth object in the Messier catalog. And typically, double clusters, they have uh, more than a million stars. Um, and two of the very well known and well studied double clusters are M3 and M4. And by observing many, many uh, such white dwarfs and figuring out that there is not a single white dwarf whose mass is greater than the Chandrasekhar limit. It was observationally corroborated that what Chandrasekhar had deduced using his uh, relativistic uh, analysis of degenerate electron gas uh, was correct. And that's the reason that he was essentially awarded the Nobel Prize. Right, so I talked already about clusters of star and such clusters which uh, contain more than about million stars uh, are called globular clusters. But you might wonder that are they, their objects that have larger number of stars which are gravitationally bound to each other? The answer is yes, and they are called galaxies. So here is a picture of a spiral galaxy, as you can see, uh, that via telescope, one has captured this particular galaxy. And look at the spectacular spiral arms of this galaxy. And you can see also the central region, which is fairly bright. Now, the spiral arms basically trace out those regions where young stars are forming. Normally, when young stars form, they are the main sequence stars. And young and massive main sequence stars, they are very bright. And therefore, when one observes a galaxy uh, through a telescope, we uh, one tends to pick up the bright stars and one sees the beautiful spiral patterns. But it doesn't mean 
that there are no stars between the spiral arms. It is just that those stars are older and therefore they are not shining so brightly. But otherwise, the if you are tracing out mass and not the light, if you are trace, tracing the mass, then uh, such spiral galaxies appear like disc-shaped spiral galaxy with a bulge close to the center of the spiral galaxy. And the globular clusters essentially go in eccentric orbits. They are, no, they are not distributed in a disc shape. Rather, globular clusters, they form a spheroidal halo around the disc of the spiral galaxy. And of course, the entire thing is embedded in a, in a dark matter halo, which of course can't be seen. Here is another spiral galaxy, but this spiral galaxy has more number of arms than the previous spiral galaxy. And there are also regions which are extremely dark and they could be due to the presence of dust. What the dust uh, uh, does is that it absorbs the visible part of the spectrum and re-radiate in the infrared domain. So in the optical, if one is using an optical telescope, one would see the dark uh, part where the dust is absorbing the optical radiation and re-radiating them in the infrared wavelength. The other kind of galaxies, which are huge, they are of monstrous size, much bigger than spiral galaxies. And their distribution of stars are mostly spheroidal. In fact, not only they are spheroidal, they are triaxial, means they are not oblate or prolate. The oblate and prolate, they have Two of the axes identical, but here the distribution is such that they can be uh, defined by a spheroidal distribution which is triaxial, meaning any shell would have an equation which is of the type x square by a square plus y square by b square plus z square by c square is equal to 1 where A, B, and C, all three, three of them are <clears throat> not identical. Such systems are called uh, triaxial system. Now, this particular elliptical galaxy is the M87 galaxy, and you can see a tiny jet coming out. So, this is the famous M87 uh, galaxy whose supermassive black hole, which is at the center, was recently mapped by uh, the, the not the supermassive black hole per se, but the region uh, which is just outside the event horizon, the so-called photosphere region was mapped out by the event horizon telescope. Here, let me also point out that so far, all the prominent galaxies that astronomers have studied, they all the galaxies seem to have a supermassive black hole sitting at the center. Uh, by supermassive black hole, I mean those black holes whose mass is more than a million times sun's mass. Such black holes are called supermassive black holes.
here is another elliptical galaxy but this elliptical galaxy has a nice disk like dust lane and because it gives them impression of a type of mexican hat called sombrero that's the reason why this elliptical galaxy is called a sombrero galaxy and again here the brightness you see are due to individual stars that are moving in eccentric orbit uh, with respect to the central region of the galaxy only the part form forming the dust lane a disk like part that would have rotation but otherwise stars of an elliptical galaxy they essentially a uh, different star go in a different eccentric orbit so that the net angular momentum is very tiny due to the stars by now you must have seen that galaxies come in different size and shape so uh, this is the so called hubble classification of galaxies which uh, essentially says that there are as far as galaxies are concerned roughly but by now we know there are more varieties of galaxies but roughly when hubble did the study he could figure out that there are spiral galaxies of the type sa sb sc by this classification what uh, hubble meant was sc galaxies the spiral arms are not so tightly bound they are much more open as you go to sp sb type spiral galaxy the spiral arms are somewhat tightly bound and for sa they are even more tightly bound similarly there are barred spiral galaxies where you can see that apart from spiral arms the central region has a bar like shape and again you can see that for sb c type there is a bar of course but the arms are much more um, open they are not so closely uh, tied together while as you progress towards a uh, barred galaxy of the type a the spiral arms are most more uh, closely spaced similarly in the case of elliptical galaxies there are uh, uh, elliptical galaxies which are more spherical in nature hubble called it called such galaxies e0 and progressively they become uh, flattened out as you go to uh, e7 then there are also so type um, galaxies where the uh, size in one direction is longer in the case of e0 the other side si uh, length was longer uh, not but remember that i have already mentioned that in the case of elliptical galaxies we know today that the three axes are different so we cannot really think of this as a prolate and this as an oblate and so on and i must here mention that uh, such a picture the hubble classification sometimes gives the impression that they are all linked uh, they are not it is not that as though uh, elliptical galaxies evolved into spiral and another branch evolved into uh, barred galaxies that is not at all correct in fact what is known today uh, there is a large consensus about it today is that elliptical galaxies are actually formed by the uh, gravitational merging of uh, two or more spiral galaxies okay? so the consensus of the theory about the theory of formation of elliptical galaxy is that it is the merging of two or more spiral galaxies that lead to the formation of ellipticals so uh, so this hubble classification 
tends to be a little bit of uh, misleading nature. But once we know what we are talking about, uh, then we understand. It just shows that there are varieties of galaxies in nature. It, 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 there is this picture doesn't uh, talk about any evolution from one to another. Similarly, there are also irregular galaxies, galaxies that are highly disrupted. For example, our Milky Way galaxy has two neighbors, the so-called small Magellanic cloud and large Magellanic cloud. Now, note that India being in the northern hemisphere of the globe, we can never see the small Magellanic cloud or the large Magellanic cloud because they can be visible only from the southern part of the globe. That is either from South Africa or from Australia and so on. And the reason why they are called a small Magellanic cloud or a large Magellanic cloud is because Magellan, who essentially covered uh, in his long travels all around the globe, uh, he was the first to observe uh, these uh, small Magellanic cloud and the large Magellanic cloud. Here is a comparison of sizes of M87, our Milky Way galaxy, Andromeda galaxy, which is called M31, and similarly the Whirlpool galaxy, which roughly presents this on to um, the terrestrial observers. Of course, these are essentially the artist's conception of these galaxies. But you can see how big is the elliptical galaxy M87 compared to Milky Way uh, or Andromeda galaxy. Incidentally, uh, there is now a consensus coming up that uh, it may not be that uh, Milky Way galaxy is small compared to Andromeda galaxy. They might be actually in uh, of comparable sizes. So we will wait for further observations. So I must therefore reiterate that these are artist impression of Milky Way, Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda galaxy. Yes. And because of powerful telescopes like Hubble Space Telescope, which is a telescope on board a uh, satellite in space and therefore its uh, uh, ability to see distant objects is far greater than terrestrial um, based telescopes and Hubble has detected many interacting galaxies. You can see that this spiral galaxy is interacting with another galaxy. Here two galaxies have interacted and because of each other's tidal forces, the galaxies have got essentially torn apart. In fact, the small Magellanic cloud and large Magellanic cloud, they have been disturbed by the tidal forces of our own Milky Way galaxy. And here you can see uh, two spiral galaxies, they were spiral galaxies, but because of the close encounter and the resulting tidal forces, they, the matter is getting stretched in this direction and also in the opposite direction. And eventually, uh, because of the kinetic energy being uh, shared with the stars, they will eventually merge. And when they settle down over millions of billions of years, they will turn into elliptical galaxy. So in other words, the purpose of my showing this panel of interacting uh, galaxies is that 
uh, indeed the the theory that elliptical galaxies have been created by merger of uh, two or more spiral galaxies uh, is quite a plausible theory and uh, the evidences are uh, essentially pointing towards uh, the corroboration of elliptical galaxies being formed out of the mergers of spiral galaxies. So here are more such uh, merging spiral galaxies. Now, you might ask the question that, OK, fine. Um, we have stars uh, forming galaxies by forming a bound system. Are there galaxies which form a bound system? The answer is yes. For example, this is a picture of a cluster of galaxies. So individual galaxies are forming a huge cluster. Typically, clusters of galaxies were observed by the astronomer Abel. And Abel clusters of galaxies, they are uh, essentially rich clusters of galaxies. And an Abel cluster of galaxy typically has uh, around 1,000 galaxies. But remember, when in astronomy, when I quote a number, 1,000 or a million, what one means is it could be 2,000, it could be 3,000. Similarly, when I say Gobbler cluster has million stars, it doesn't mean exactly million. It can mean 2 million, 3 million, 4 million. Because remember, when we are making a statement regarding cosmos, we are limited by the resolution power of our telescopes and the resolution power is both angular resolution as well as the uh, amount of uh, light it can receive so that uh, the resolution to see fainter objects. Can our telescope really see very faint object? That would depend upon the area of the telescope, more the area, more the light, more the amount of light will, uh, that it can uh, collect. And therefore, uh, to see faint objects, we need larger uh, telescopes. And larger telescopes also improve the angular resolution because there is this diffraction uh, limit which says that uh, if you are using any optical device, at wavelength lambda and the optical device has a size d, then the angular resolution is of the order of lambda divided by d. So if the d, the size of the optical device uh, increases given a wavelength, then angular resolution also increases. In other words, for doing uh, good astronomy, we need larger telescopes so that the light collecting area is large, hence we can see fainter objects. And to see uh, the faint objects, the minor details uh, of the faint object, we need higher angular resolution and large size also help in the uh, our angular uh, resolution, attaining our uh, angular resolution. And uh, therefore, when we make a statement in uh, astronomy, very often the error bars are large. And that is the reason I said when I say 1,000, it doesn't mean exactly 1,000. It can be uh, more or less. And in astronomy, typically, the error bars are larger. Remember that uh, unlike laboratory science, we can't do a controlled experiment uh, with astronomical objects in our lab. All we can do is use powerful telescopes to observe whatever is happening with our cosmic objects. We can't uh, force the cosmic objects 
uh, as of now to uh, do any controlled experiment but whatever naturally is happening uh, naturally meaning according to the laws of physics whatever course of evolution is uh, taking place for the cosmic object that we can capture by uh, peering through a telescope at such a cosmic object so astronomy and astrophysics as well as cosmology is limited by uh, this particular aspect and by now you also know that the other difference between uh, astronomy astrophysics with uh, rest of the uh, subjects of physics is that the that of the scale the scales that define the cosmic objects are huge compared to the uh, laboratory um, physics that we deal with by now you have realized that for example even if you take the solar system the distance between earth and sun which is called one astronomical unit is of the order of 10 to the power 13 cm okay so in terms of kilometers it is of the order of 10 to the power 8 kilometers much much larger than uh, typical distances uh, we speak of when we talk about our earth similarly the mass of sun which is 2 into 10 to the power 33 gram is a huge object a huge number we will never refer to such numbers uh, in uh, in the context of earth or even concerning uh, the earthly uh, phenomena that's going on uh, in our society and in the beginning therefore astrophysics appears difficult because the lens scale the scale of mass the time scales are so very different from the scales that we are familiar with otherwise once you become very very comfortable with the astronomical numbers associated with cosmic objects you will find doing astrophysics is relatively simpler than uh, let's say doing condensed matter physics uh, theoretical condensed matter physics all right it is only the scales that initially uh, bewilder uh, cause a bewilderment among students when they first encounter astrophysics and that is the reason i have been uh, telling you that uh, do the simple numerical problems they are very simple you just have to use arithmetic um, uh, algebra to do the problems given in frank shue's book only when you do this simple numerical problems you start slowly assimilating the huge scales that are associated with cosmic objects and uh, once you become comfortable then you will find astrophysics uh, doing astrophysics is not at all difficult for example in this picture uh, let us talk about the scales so if you take a typical spiral galaxy as you can see this is a spiral galaxy which is uh, edge on to the telescope and that's why we are seeing it as a disk if you had seen it from this direction then it would appear like a proper spiral galaxy with spiral arms and this disk if you look at the size of the disk this length will be of the order of you know uh, 15 to 30 kiloparsec as i told you 1 parsec is 3.26 light years a kiloparsec is 1000 parsec and therefore uh, we know that the scales of typical 
uh, spiral galaxies, they are the, the distance between one point of the disk to other point is goes, um, let's say, 15 kiloparsec to uh, you know, 30 or 40 kiloparsecs. While the uh, elliptical galaxies tend to be uh, much larger and uh, they could be uh, 10 times larger, 20 times larger and so on because they are uh, they form as a result of merger of two or more spiral galaxies. A cluster of galaxies would typically have thousand galaxies, all right? And the size of a typical uh, cluster of galaxy will be of the order of two to six million parsec or two to six megaparsec. What is the megaparsec? One megaparsec is 10 raised to power 6 parsec. I've already told you uh, what a parsec is. A parsec, once again, is 3.26 light years or equivalently, one parsec is 3 into 10 raised to power 18 centimeter. Or if you want to express it in kilometers, then one parsec is 3 into 10 raised power 13 kilometers, all right? And uh, you can see, therefore, the size of a cluster can go uh, from few megaparsecs to about six to seven megaparsecs. They are huge objects. You might ask, what about masses? Well, as we know, a typical galaxy like our Milky Way galaxy, a Milky Way galaxy, uh, like galaxy, has typically 10 to the power 11 stars. That means 100 billion stars. Okay, And um, you might uh, be a little bit uh, puzzled to know that uh, a Milky Way-like galaxy having 100 billion stars, um, this number is also uh, sort of important for number of brain cells in a typical human brain. Human brain also has about 10 to the power 11 neurons. Well, uh, and just a coincidence, after all, Milky Way type galaxies are not the only galaxies. You have elliptical galaxies, you have um, big uh, spiral galaxies and so on. It's just a coincidence. And therefore, a Milky Way type galaxy, if you ask, what is its mass like? The mass that is trapped in stars. We have already said that there is dark matter halo around every galaxy. All right? And uh, hence, if you look at the mass of a Milky Way type galaxy, which is trapped in suns, that will be about 10 to the power 33 multiplied by 10 to the power 11. That means 10 to the power 44 grams. And if you take a cluster which has 1,000 of the order of 1,000 galaxy, the again, a cluster also has dark matter, not just dark matter associated with individual galaxy, but as a whole also, it is uh, having diffused dark matter all around. In fact, the interesting thing is that the first evidence of dark matter came from studies of clusters. That is a separate story. We will talk about it when I talk about the real theorem and uh, how uh, the um, uh, dark matter evidence came by looking at clusters of galaxies. That is uh, a topic which will be covered in a later lecture. So, as you can see, because a typical uh, Milky Way type galaxy would have mass in stars of the order of 10 to the power 44 grams, therefore, baryonic mass, which is associated with a cluster of galaxy, will be more than 10 to the power 47 grams. Okay? That means more than 10 to the power 44 kilograms. You can see the 
humongous numbers we are dealing with. Okay? Time scales are also very large. Now remember that I have so far not spoken about velocities. <coughs> so let me here uh, uh, pause for a while and um, tell you about velocities. You see, in our solar system, Earth is going around Sun. If you ask, <coughs> what is the velocity of Earth with respect to Sun, you will find the answer is close to 20 kilometers per second. That's a large number, 20 kilometers per second. Remember that typically uh, cars move at uh, velocity 60 miles per hour or let's say uh, 75 kilometers per hour. But that's small compared to Earth's speed around Sun, which is about 20 kilometers per second. The solar system itself is going around the uh, center of our Milky Way galaxy, which contains a supermassive black hole, of course. And our solar system is going around the supermassive black hole. And with respect to the supermassive black hole, our solar system is moving with a speed of the order of 220 kilometers per second. It's a huge number, 220 kilometers per second. Similarly, in a rich cluster like coma cluster of a galaxy, the galaxies are also moving randomly inside the cluster. And what is the typical dispersion velocity of galaxies in a cluster? It, the, the dispersion velocity goes from 1000 km per second to about 1500 km per second. Note the numbers, 1000 km per second. It's a huge number. Compare it with the speed of light. Speed of light is 3 into 10 to the power 5 kilometers per second. All right. While although the galaxies in a cluster, they are uh, moving certainly uh, with non-relativistic speeds, but they are huge, 1500 kilometers per second. Of course, uh, velocities have to be measured with respect to a frame of reference. When I say 1500 kilometers per second, I mean with respect to the center of the clusters of galaxy. Okay. Now you might ask, well, we see that stars are grouped in globular clusters. Globular clusters are uh, moving in bigger uh, conglomeration of stars called galaxies. Galaxies themselves can form bound systems called clusters of galaxies. Are there bigger structure? The answer is yes. So if you take the APM galaxy survey, which was uh, compiled by Maddox in late 80s, you can see each bright spot okay, is either a galaxy or a cluster of galaxy. And here you can see shells, prominent shells, filaments and shells. So the shells and filaments, they are termed as superclusters. Of course, unlike clusters of galaxies where galaxies are indeed gravitationally bound system, these superclusters are uh, not strongly bound uh, gravitationally. In some cases, the supercluster may not be bound at all. They are just chance, uh, uh, their, their position is chance correlated and that, that's the reason why they appear as filaments. 
here i must mention that recently a supercluster was uh, sort of uh, studied and given the name uh, by the ayuka astronomers as well as kerala university professor who was part of the program and uh, you can uh, look at uh, the papers concerning saraswati uh, supercluster and uh, the superclusters they are uh, huge structures and uh, the uh, many of the dynamics associated with superclusters are still being actively researched and it is likely there are many surprises for example there are large voids okay the dark region there are as you can see there is a paucity of sources whether the dark voids are uh, yes whether the dark voids have absolutely no matter we can't be certain they can be dark matter in this uh, region but nevertheless we see voids and filaments all right well i don't know what happened uh let me share just one moment huh? the slide seem to have uh, gone off i'm just trying to yeah right so i've got back the slide uh, right so uh, there are lot of uh, work which are going on uh, on uh, studies of superclusters and in future they may reveal lot of uh, new things and i will just stop uh, today's session by just uh, telling you how these structures have come about uh, of course this is only the theoretical aspect it is uh, believed that the so called dark matter because they don't feel the radiation pressure and therefore uh, they can form seeds and over which the dark matter further can come together and form gigantic gravitational potential well in which baryonic matter can fall in seeing the attractive gravitational potential well and form bigger structures like galaxies uh, anyway we will talk about it uh, later but um, i think uh, already we have crossed the time limit so now i would like to uh, answer questions instead of uh, uh, lecturing uh, about further contents yes so let me uh, go uh, to the questions yeah so there is a question from uh, glena devi uh, what type of questions will be asked in the exam uh, as uh, we know that uh, we normally test the understanding and analytical thinking ability of students we will be uh, giving simple numericals in this course and that's precisely the reason i am saying that you must do the numerical problems given in frank shue's book uh, so they will essentially be uh, problem type questions which uh, sooner i will start covering them at the moment because 
we are finding that still uh, some students are uh, coming in uh, in the course once the uh, number of students who credit that course it settles down then once the number settles down then we will go into quantitative uh, estimates simple estimates and quantitative estimates all right right there is other another question which says in the early universe what was the chance of having nuclear synthesis yes it did happen when the universe was um, dense that means when the universe was dense and temperature was higher uh, higher than uh, about 200 milli electron volt there were nuclear synthesis going on in fact big bang nuclear synthesis is a uh, research topic by itself and early pioneers of big bang nuclear synthesis were gamo george gamo and his collaborators and because of this work only they could predict the existence of cosmic microwave background radiation and uh, the light element abundance like deuterium uh, lithium and so on so uh, indeed early universe when the temperature was high and uh, density was high uh, nuclear synthesis did take place let me address ankit yadav's question well the red giant star it has already the envelope slowly uh, moves out because the white dwarf's radiation it slowly uh, exerts pressure on the envelope of the red giant star and it forms a nebulous structure all around the white dwarf and due to some strange reason this nebula around the white dwarf uh is called a planetary nebula it has nothing to do with planet it just because of the radiation from the white dwarf uh the envelope gets gets blown out and forms a diffuse shell maybe that's the reason why it is called planetary nebula while it has nothing to do with uh the planets per se and the matter in this uh planetary nebula the mass is small so therefore they cannot the planetary nebula by itself is unlikely to form new stars if you are asking uh, whether uh, remember the white dwarf itself is uh, having a mass less than 1.4 solar mass it is already a compact object so it cannot further go into anything else until the following thing happens if you have a white dwarf will let's say one solar mass and due to some reason more and more mass keeps falling onto this white dwarf because the white dwarf maybe is having a companion star so both the objects are going around the common center of mass and if the companion star loses matter to the white dwarf so that white dwarf's mass keeps on increasing and when from one solar mass its mass becomes 1.4 solar mass boom it just implodes because it exceeds the critical uh mass and it explodes like a supernova i have not yet talked about supernova um uh, talked about supernova and supernova uh, and such a supernova is called type one a supernova if we have time in the course we'll talk about it now let me come to mayank's question uh yes so uh, uh, luminosity of uh, the 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 uh, amount of radiation per unit time from a star decreases with time for example a red giant star it is not shining as brightly as 
a main sequence star. After all, the source of energy is still the thermonuclear reaction going on at the core, uh, in the core of the star. So therefore, uh, as the star evolves, the luminosity does change. So old stars typically are fainter than young stars. Let me take Shruti's question. Yeah, so that's a good question. Why are the, uh, if you don't take into account the elliptical galaxies, why are the galaxies which are spiral in shape, why are the disk galaxies spiral in shape? First of all, the shape, disk-like shape tells us that the structure that gave rise to disk-like galaxy had a lot of angular momentum. That's the reason why, why when the gaseous matter fell into the deep gravitational potential well uh, created by the dark matter, this gaseous matter, due to either tidal torquing of neighboring uh, uh, dark matter halo or whatever is causing the angular momentum, the gaseous matter had angular momentum and therefore they could not, when they were falling into the deep gravitational potential well due to the dark matter, they could not just collapse into a spherical object, but they formed a disk-like structure because rotation means that there is centrifugal forces which will prohibit matter to radially fall in. And then, once you have a disk-like structure, uh, astrophysicists like Lin and Shu, Shu, the same Shu, a Frank Shu, Lin and Shu developed a theory uh, of density wave. And uh, the density wave theory tells us that because of this differential rotation of the gas, a high density wave in the form of a spiral pattern moves outwards from the central region and the high density wave because it is propagating and wherever the density is high, the gene sensitivity makes sure that in such high dense region, new stars are born due to gene sensitivity. Of course, the wave is not static, it is propagating. So wherever the density becomes higher, new stars will form. And because the density wave has a spiral pattern, that's the reason why one sees a spiral arm, because spiral arms are the region where new and bright stars are forming. You can take a look at Frank Shue's book, The Physical Universe, to get a a simple idea of the density wave theory. But the actual theory is very complicated. I myself have not studied the actual uh, density wave theory uh, in its full mathematical glory. Let me come to um, Devinder Kumar's question. Well, as I said, that elliptical galaxies they have formed due to mergers uh, of uh, two or more spiral galaxies. And precisely because of that, because different spiral galaxies will have different angular momentum, and angular momentum being vector quantity, uh, the resultant object, the vectors will uh, be, have to be summed up, and therefore the net angular momentum vector uh, when two or more spiral galaxies combined will be very small. And that's the reason why spiral galaxies are uh, essentially spheroidal with three different axis size are formed. They don't have, uh, they don't show much of rotation, rotation, except for a few elliptical galaxies like sombrero galaxies where there's a dust lane. And the ratio of the major axis to minor axis uh, these are uh, arbitrary, of course, because they all depend upon the details of 
the spiral galaxies uh, that underwent merger uh, with what speed they initially approached each other what were the angular momentum of the individual spiral galaxies and therefore uh, the numbers uh, are certainly there is nothing uh, cardinal about the ratio of the major axis to minor axis and also there's a third axis as i said there are three different um, uh, axes they are generally triaxial all right yes that's right the m uh, they stand for messier's uh, objects as i mentioned because messier they are part of the messier catalog yes correct you are right priyamvada okay devender has another uh, question well as i said that uh, that is not true uh, because hubble uh, when he saw a e0 type galaxy so for example if i uh, uh, take you back to the hubble classification yeah it is a projection so in the projection you feel that it's an elliptical side with just two axes but as i said that is not true it is uh, there are three axes you are only seeing a projected part where there seems to be a major axis and minor axis but there is also a third axis all right and uh, they were later on inferred by more detailed observation of star densities and making lot of models okay here is another question by shubham uh, and shubham is asking how do we measure the mass of a galaxy that's a very good question uh, so uh, i haven't so far told you uh, how does an astronomer measure masses of objects cosmic objects so for example how do you measure the mass of sun no one goes with a spring balance uh, to the sun and weighs uh, sun's mass so therefore it's a good question that how would you measure masses of cosmic objects so let's take the how do you measure the mass of sun well the first thing is to measure the distance between earth and sun as i said earth and sun distance we can measure using parallax method okay parallax method would tell us the distance knowing the distance how do you go about measuring the mass of sun you also measure the orbit period of earth going around sun that is no it's about 365. you know to five uh days okay so we know the orbital period we know the earth sun distance now what will you do you will say that ha huh, i know newton's laws of gravitation the fact that earth is almost going in a circular orbit around sun what will i do i'll say that the centripetal force to keep the earth in a circular orbit must be sun's gravitational pull and hence sun's gravitational pull which is minus uh, uh, let's take the magnitude let's not talk about the direction at the moment the magnitude of sun's gravitational attraction will be newton's constant g mass of the sun multiplied by mass of the earth divided by square of the earth sun distance this must be the force which will supply the centripetal force what is the centripetal force it is 
mass of the earth times square of the velocity of earth divided by earth sun distance so mv square by r will be equal to gm sun m divided by r square where m is the earth of a uh, mass of the earth but mm gets cancelled because they appear on both sides so called galilean equivalence principle in other words we find that v square by r must be equal to g m sun divided by r square or in other words v square is equal to g m sun divided by r velocity is simply 2 pi r times the orbital period of earth sun because 2 pi r is the circumference of the earth's orbit and velocity therefore is 2 pi r divided by earth sun uh, earth's orbital period is roughly 365.25 days and therefore uh, uh, we already know the gravitational constant which was estimated by newton cavendish and many other people so gravitational constant in cgs units is 6.67 into 10 to the power minus 8 in cgs units so use this and get the mass of sun so what i suggest as an exercise so for all students who have credited this course take this as an ex uh, exercise i give you the earth sun distance i give you the distance and the distance is uh, let's say 1.6 into 10 to the power 13 cm take this number and i also give you the orbital period of earth around uh, the sun which is about 365.25 uh, days estimate the sun's mass this is an exercise i give it to you so now you have estimated the mass of sun incidentally mass of earth no one asked me how do you calculate uh, estimate mass of earth mass of earth again this is an exercise for you use the same physical principle to estimate the mass of earth using the motion of what motion of moon all right so using the motion of moon and the distance of moon from earth estimate the mass of earth these are the two simple numerical problems i have given you please work them out in full detail all right all of you who have credited the course please work out the detail and estimate the mass of sun and mass of moon respectively right now let's find out how do you measure the mass of milky way measure the mass of milky way you can't use this kind of technique here what astronomers do is rely on counting the number of stars and how do you estimate the mass of a distant star unless the stars are in a binary system you can measure the mass of the star if two stars are going around in a binary then by monitoring the motion of the two stars in a binary use the same technique you can estimate the masses but many of the stars that you see are isolated stars you can't only these days you can see exoplanets going around some uh, stars but most of the stars you don't even see exoplanets so how do you measure the mass of the stars here comes the entire technique of finding the spectrum of a star from that using the stellar evolution theory to make a connection between mass and luminosity so a lot of stellar evolution theory a lot of theoretical model goes on to find how does 
a star's luminosity during different stellar evolution phase depend upon the mass of the star. And here, the temperature, the surface temperature of a star plays a very, very important role. For example, a very massive star having mass of the order of 30 times sun's mass, and if it is a main sequence star, then the surface temperature will be exceedingly hot. The peak of the spectrum would be uh, towards the blue part of the spectrum. So studying the spectrum of the star becomes very important so that one can model uh, at what stage the star is in and by using the stellar evolution model uh, which have been worked out over the last 100 years or so by many, many, many astrophysicists, including Shaker, uh, you use the stellar evolution model by and by looking at the spectrum luminosity, you estimate the mass of the star. For binary stars, you can measure the mass using uh, the dynamical motion, just like uh, one measures the mass of a star. It's a very, very complicated process. And that's the reason why this is a separate field by itself. And once one charts out, one uh, sort of uh, observationally figure how many stars are there uh, within Milky Way, you start estimating the mass of the Milky Way. And, uh, and few minutes back, I mentioned that uh, initially, the mass of the Milky Way was underestimated. It was thought that it is uh, appreciably smaller than uh, Andromeda Galaxy, but apparently it is not so. Astronomers are working hard and the mass would be uh, either equal or greater than uh, the Andromeda Galaxy mass. And similarly, different galaxies' mass is estimated by finding out the luminosity of the galaxy as a whole, finding out what kind of mass to luminosity ratio does one have. And there's a lot of modeling that goes uh, in uh, to estimate the mass of galaxies. So that is the job of professional astronomers and professional astrophysicists. And when you go into the nitty gritty, then of course, a lot of quantitative analysis that goes on in the field. And then, of course, the subject would be as hard as any other uh, field of physics. Okay. Are there more questions? If there are no more questions, uh, I will uh, again emphasize, please, the topics that I've covered, please go to the book, The Physical Universe, authored by Frank Shu. And whatever topics I have covered so far, go to the numerical problems associated with uh, these topics and do the numerical problems. Remember, in physics, as I tell my students, the way to learn is to take paper and pen and do calculations. That is when we start understanding the subject by working out uh, using uh, expressions and physical principles, crunching out numbers. That is how we understand uh, more and more uh, subjects in physics. And in particular, uh, the two exercises that I have given, estimating the mass of sun and mass of moon, uh, earth, please do them. Okay. So uh, once again, uh, thank you for attending the session. I will uh, close the session now.
and we will again meet uh, at 10:30 on saturday by the way please talk to uh, talk among yourself and decide for the second session uh, is 5 o'clock uh, every saturday is okay or you want to have another uh, afternoon uh, uh, in another weekday so please decide okay uh, i will stop for now uh, so have a great evening